Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for John Baptiste. The song that you just heard is Oscar nominated for um, original song. And it was. It's, that song is so intricately connected to the documentary. You know, can you tell us the genesis of writing such a beautiful song? Hello. <laughs> Yes, it never went away. Oh, I I love that um that theme, thinking about the things that never go away, love, and all of the things that we care about from every human being across time. There's certain things that are within all of us, our cares, our desires, and concerns that will never go away and also the allegory of love that you have for a person. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to say something at the end of the film that captured that emotion, and it could only be captured in a song. You've seen so much, and you've experienced so much with us. And the end, we needed a culminating moment to match the scene. And we hadn't decided to do this until the days before the first premiere at Telluride. And I was there. Yeah, I know. That's, it's amazing that we pulled it off because <laughs> Matt, who, you know, he didn't really share with us so many of his edits or cuts of the film, but he did at times share scenes. And he would say, what do you think of this? And we had very candid conversations to make this film because it was very much a vulnerable moment to, to live through. So we'd become very honest with each other. And Sulaik and I both told him, we don't like this last scene. He just sent it to us separate from the rest of the film. And it was um, so different to anything he had shown us before. I think it just was jarring. And we decided together, oh, it's because there's, there's something missing. And the song needed to happen. So that's when I had to figure out the song. It was so last minute. It was not how I usually... <laughs> The, the piano theme in the song is a lullaby. Can you tell us about the significance of that? So the lullabies were the source material for this song because I wanted something that felt honest to the film and the experience. And I didn't just want to write a song flat out cold turkey just to fit the end of the film. I didn't think it would resonate that way. So. It's not in the actual film, but during this period, I was writing lullabies for Sulaika when she was in the hospital. And the lullabies were to create a sense of rest and peace in the hospital room. The rest that you feel in the hospital room sometimes is disrupted by beeping or people coming in and out. And it's not the most restful environment. Sometimes, you know, there are angels in there saving lives, but sometimes it's hard to get some Zs. So I would write these lullabies and I would have them playing on loop from my computer. So I had several hours of lullaby themes and melodies and ding boo ding 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 that's an allegory for the river stream subconscious the the stream of consciousness that stream that all creativity comes from that stream that's been there since the beginning of time that just lulls you into a place of dreams where your inspiration comes from. And that's what I was thinking about with that theme. And then I used that theme when we had to write a song as the basis of the song. So it was all born from this experience and I felt it was honest and fit in the movie best. I'm glad you brought up 
the fact that you've been thinking about this for a long time because when you just told the story that you make it sound like it was easy for you to write the song, there was obviously a lot of experience and, and thought prior. Yes, a lot of processing. You know, you process things in life and I process things often with music. So I would write these lullabies and they came from the experience that Laika and I were, were having together and going through this the music came from that and thinking about that and how all these things are interconnected and how the film, even though we didn't know we were making a film until it was a film, um, just all of it going from being about the symphony to being about the symphony and also the symphony of life and how it all is interconnected. And then how do you say that simply in a song? So it wasn't easy. <laughs> It was very difficult to process it, but I had already been in that space. So I think when it was finally time to actually say it, it came out when I needed it. <laughs> the scope of this documentary is so expansive, but that wasn't always the case, correct? I mean, it started, it was solely to document the process of you writing American Symphony, correct? Yes. And and then while you were filming, that's when you found out about Soleika's diagnosis and also the Grammy nominations, correct? Yes, it was in the same week. Imagine that the duality of the, the news of being nominated for 11 Grammys and also your wife, the person you love the most, has a life-threatening illness. You know, we found out in the most dramatic ways you could imagine for, for a filmmaker to, to figure out how to tell one of those stories is hard, but to braid together all of these narratives, the road to the Grammys, the story of illness and the story of our marriage and how you, you know, for Sulaika, who's a storyteller extraordinaire, she has written books, he's an Emmy Award winning columnist, New York Times documented her story with with cancer, so her vision of, of what the story could be and all of that now in this story about the symphony and the Grammys and <laughs> it could have just been all over the place. So really incredible team, Matt Heinemann, the producers, all of the team that was in the edit room, 1,500 hours of footage later made this film. 1,500 hours of footage. So. The beginning was something much simpler. We wanted to document this process of this symphony that is, in my mind, a reimagining of what a symphony orchestra and a symphony could be. If you take musicians from, you know, the indigenous American musicians, we have native musicians, we have musicians who play electronic instruments, we have classical musicians, jazz musicians, musicians from Venezuela, musicians from Cuba, musicians from Africa, all of this coming together to make the modern symphony. And I thought a boring process documentary about that <laughs> would be great. I would watch it, even if it was the only person in the world would watch it. <laughs> I just wanted to document that for me, you know, for I've been making music since I was a little boy, and that was just the culmination of all of my musical study and experience, and even just for me to have a, a friend who had met, I'd worked with him in the past and we were friends and he was documenting that. And I was like, well, even if it doesn't end up being a film, it'll be just some, some great footage of a process that is, is really a big deal for me and for the culture of music and people who care about that kind of stuff. I couldn't help but think that, that Matthew, your director, was so, was able to adapt so well. And it, it, I kept thinking that you and Soleika also are artists that are, you guys were having to adapt so much as well. Yes. Um, I'm also, uh, in, uh, there's a line that Soleika says in the documentary, sometimes you feel like, you, um, uh, no, sorry, living a life of contrast is a lot. Um, it, did you feel that same way while all of this was happening? Yes, it was a dance. It was a dance between Matt and us. And those were things that in the, in, in the process of filming, you can't plan for. Those things we're talking about with 
each of these different storylines coming together as one. You can't plan for that. So it had to be a dance. It had to be an improvisation. And that required him at times pushing for access and us at times saying no. <laughs> and it required us to have conversations about whether we wanted to keep filming, which happened every month. Um, we constantly had to reassess whether or not we wanted to keep filming. There were no partners. I, I, we didn't have Netflix on board even by the final edit. There was no partnership with the Obamas and Higher Ground. It was just us with cameras and living life. So you can imagine how tenuous that is to not even know if this film is going to be something, let alone to know if Sulaika is going to make it, let alone to know if, you know, all of the things that were narrative tension in the film were real life for us. So it was not just the dance of how do you make a film, it was a dance of how do you organize and negotiate the contract of trust that we had built between us. How do we have this trust that we've built and this thing that we're making that we don't really know quite what it is? How do we just keep moving forward every day and coupled with the dangers of it? There's a there's so many intimate moments. I'm, I'm like shocked to hear that there were things that you did not want shown because, I mean, your wedding is there. Uh, going to doctor visits, treatments. It, it, this is an incredibly intimate documentary. Well, there are things that are in there that we don't want shown. <laughs> there are things we didn't want shown, and he pushed for the access, and he got it. <laughs> so when you have 1,500 hours of footage, it's, and, it, and this is over the course of seven or eight months, so you can do the math, how much the camera was running. There were certain things we couldn't give access to because it was beyond, it was outside of our purview to give access. Like the Grammys, he snuck into the Grammys and filmed it <laughs> on an iPhone. Um, truly, it was, it was, he was there in a t-shirt and jeans and an iPhone. Or, uh, the, you know, the hospital scenes, Sulaika and I were, were, at first there was a lot of caution around that and also obviously for, for health reasons and you'd have COVID that still was a thing and still going around in the world and she couldn't get sick or she would die. if She got a common cold. So at certain point, points I would, and she couldn't, she wasn't always in the frame of mind to make a decision. So in those moments, he wanted to film and I would just say no in protection of her. So those are moments where it was just, a no-go, but there had to be something severe like that <laughs> for it to not be in the film. Talking about living a life of contrast, you mentioned the Grammys. The following day, you're in the hospital room with, with Soleika. What, I mean, how, how do you process something like that? I'm still processing it. <laughs> you don't process it. You just live it, and you try to find forward momentum, upward trajectory. Move, move, move. And I'm just curious, how was it for you after, you know, seeing the film, seeing that, that chapter where, you know, you have the Grammys, top of the world, and then the next day you're, you're dealing with, with the heartbreak? It, it really is what life is for all of us. I've realized the lesson in that time, and it's really the lesson that I think, one of the many lessons that I gather from watching the film, because for me the film is new. I'm living through this, and then I watch the film, and I, it's, you're in such a mode of, of pushing through that you don't even remember some of the things in the grave detail that is captured in. So I, I watch it, and one of the things I take away is this idea that there is no real duality of life. There is no highs and lows. It's all one. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's all one. And everybody's going through everything all the time. Correct. And you see people who are in the public eye, and no one's exempt from the human condition. People are going through things, and you may not know it. It's just because of um, the way things are set up in society and the way that the world is. And, you know, sometimes we don't ask the right questions to know. 
but everybody is going through the whole range of all of it. Yeah. And sometimes it's more than others, but the spectrum is connected. It's never, these are the great times and these are the rough times. It's all times. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, which leads me to, I, I, I have deep respect for you to allowing us to see you taking care of your mental health. Um, and, and put in that. Was that something that you had to struggle to put it out there for us to see? No, that's definitely something I didn't want to put out there. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. Definitely, it was totally not, um, it, it's counterintuitive. Think about a therapy session, you're naked. <laughs> uh, it's, a, uh, it's a moment where you're saying the toughest things that you're dealing with and you're trusting the process, you don't know the solution in these moments. So if you have an anxiety attack, anybody who has that sort of that 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 sort of reaction to stress and when you're under duress, if that's how your body reacts, you know that it's not a moment where you want anyone to be near. It's it's not something that's it's it's um a, a very intuitive thing to want to share. But again, I thought about this and Sulaik and I thought about this together as a family. Well. If we're gonna do this, whatever this is, whatever it ends up being, what would be the most powerful and the deepest reason why that we can root ourselves in? What's the greater why? Why are we doing this? It's not vanity. I think documentary has, you know, often, especially with celebrity documentaries, taken over by this sense of, um, of, of narrative that drives at a product. And um, I don't, I don't particularly like watching that. So if we were making a film, the most helpful thing for people who are watching it, and also what I think is the best art, is the most vulnerable, rawest depiction. So that's what we chose to do. Um, um, and, and speaking of bravery, you including the voice of, voices of your detractors, that was pretty impressive. Um, was it that hard? Well, I thought, and this is, again, kudos to Matthew Heineman and the, and the team to, to tie these themes together. Matt and I would have these conversations. All of the voiceover in the film, I didn't sit in a booth to do voiceover. It would be conversations at 3 or 4 in the morning with Matt after a long day of filming, and you just don't hear him, or it would be conversations with my therapist. So you would hear just my voice. And a, a lot of things I was dealing with at that time was you, f you have so many people who have different opinions of you and nobody knows you. And all this is going on behind closed doors and the insensitivity to your humanity that is going on and also the insensitivity to your artistry and the lineage of your artistry and all the things that go into it. it it's just so interesting and so wild how to process as the artist as the human at the center of all that. So that's a lot of what I was processing. And you have to see the other side of that to see the full picture of that theme in the film. So it was just an honest, it, it would not have been as honest to not show, you know, when I'm, and I don't even really read the, the papers that often, but in the film, you know, I was reading it because there's so much that was being written about me and my music and how to perceive it. And I was just checking it out and I was really bothered by a lot of that. It'd be so contradictory. And I'm, I have such a, a well intention, I'm well intentioned when it comes to how I want people to feel when they experience my art. So it's very interesting when people come from a, a, a place of spin or a place of a hot take and what that is coming from and why. So I just was probing a lot of that and we were talking about a lot of that. So it was just a natural thing for them to include that scene where you hear or many of the scenes where you hear about the detractors. But you know, we all know that they're not right. So. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> um, another spectacular moment in the documentary is Matthew staying 
on you when you're playing the song, you're about to play the song for Suleika, and it's like over a minute of meditation. You know, can you tell us about, about that moment and how it made into the film? No, he's truly, he, he discovered something that I think informed the entire film in that moment, that, that 90 seconds or what have you, that I think he discovered something that happens when I'm writing music and you find the language of the piece that you're writing, you find the language of the world that you're creating. And the language of this film is space. And he, I think he keyed into something, and I don't want to speak for him, but just it's hard to talk about emotions or feelings or it's hard to talk about what the nature of metaphysical things are or, or prayers or all of these aspects of what's going on. But in that moment, you can see just even in the way that I'm processing things in my face and the movement of the hands in the, in the air in the room, it all tells a story. And that's masterful filmmaking to, to recognize that and to say, okay, let's leave it on the shot. Because that's saying more than we could say with 100 interviews. We're capturing what he's going through, what's in the room, what the truth of it is beyond what anybody could try to convince you of with words or whatever. So I love that because it was a decision of, of art speaking the truth. And he captured it so brilliantly that I think... Um, it informed the whole rest of the film. Wow, wow. On the same thought, there is, you're performing the symphony, and then we have the power outage, and then you just, you just start improvising. It, is, it just gives me chills just thinking about it again. Um, that moment was so, so, treacherous <laughs> to to really think about you know what was so so wild and unpredictable and and kind of just unusual about it is the power went out on stage but not the fuse that goes to the lighting or to the audience only the microphones so you have this new age symphony orchestra that we created and hand selected all these musicians to play together, which we had to invent music notation that was not standard music notation so that everybody could be on the same page because some musicians read this kind of music, some read that kind of music, some improvise, some don't improvise at all. Some play electronic instruments and they have to be in balance with some of the softest, almost archaic instruments of folk m musicians who play indigenous instruments. And to find a way for us to be on the same page took such a reinvention of the form in ways that we communicate. So we had monitors in the ears. There was moments where the electronics, which, you know, you see the modular synthesizers and samplers all being cued, would cue the orchestra to come in. And this was at the beginning of a moment where that was supposed to happen and the power goes out. So the orchestra is sitting there and they don't know what's happening. And then I'm hearing in my ear, which the only person that I could hear in my ear at this point was Matt saying, the power is out on stage. The power is out. We don't know when it's gonna come back. You have about 200 musicians sitting on stage with one shot to perform this piece. And there's no real direction of how to move forward, and there's no n known fact of when it's gonna come back to normal. And there's nobody that really understands why, because it's never happened in the history of Carnegie Hall for that to happen. <laughs> so there's no, like, method of fixing it. Correct. Everybody's kind of just waiting for it to come back on. Now, I know, in, in, as I've watched the scene back, and how calm Matt was, when he was in my ear, that he loved it. Yeah. I was almost like, did he pull the plug? Because <laughs> if you think about it, that's such great narrative tension. <laughs> you build the movie to the symphony, and then the symphony happens and the power goes out. <laughs> but, you know, what I... Well, you remain pretty cool yourself. Well, I think that all of that was... Um, 
I'm, I'm also maybe a little bit crazy. <laughs> I love that kind of thing. <laughs> because I think it really, that tension brings the best out of the, the musicians. Something about having to improvise a piano movement in the middle of a symphony that was composed, that bridge to the movement that we were about to play, create something of beauty that lives with the piece. Now, whenever we perform the piece, that piano movement that I improvised in that scene is going to be in the piece. Not, not what was originally written, but this piece. I mean, the, what you improvised. Yes, it's like an, uh, an addendum. You put it in the piece. And it, it just made so much sense. It almost needs to happen. It almost is like a, a, it was also a moment where it felt like greater forces were, were trying to, to stop the peace from happening. Because it was such, for, for those that know it, just there's so many firsts. That peace had so, it has so many things that just haven't been done in the context of Carnegie or classical music in general. And then, there's just so much, and all the musicians who came together to make it possible, being there is so unlikely. Yeah. And um, it just felt like the, up until the last minutes, there were things that were trying to stop it from happening. Even the cameras on stage, which there was a real push to not have a steady cam on stage and not have cameras there. It was 12 cameras, 13 cameras actually, that shot the concert, which, the Steadicam mic was the only mic that was able to capture the sound from the piano in that scene, because all the recording devices were out. So if we didn't push for that, we wouldn't have had a documentation of that moment. Mm. So there's so much we pushed against. The first premiere of the piece was canceled. Another thing that wasn't in the film is the first premiere of the film was supposed to be three months prior to this premiere, but I got COVID the day before. And this is all, there's so much that wasn't in the film that we captured that was going against the piece happening. So it felt kind of just like, okay, the power's out. What else is new? <laughs> um, so you premiered your film at Telluride, August 31st. Um, tell us, how did you feel when you were watching the final product? To be honest, it was as tough. I don't, I, I still watch it like this. <laughs> I can watch it through my hands. I don't, you know, I, I, I still feel very, very emotional in certain moments and reliving certain moments is hard to watch. Then I also feel, you know, when I watch it, I feel very grateful that I have, um, these incredible opportunities to do the music that I do and to represent what I represent in the culture and to have something like this to see for the next generation of musicians and artists and creatives and human beings that just care about these things that I value and so like a values, it's beautiful to have it documented. I also feel like I, I'm very blessed to have picked a great partner and I'm so grateful for her. It's like. Those are things I take away when I'm looking at the screen. And John, last question. What, what, what were your hopes uh, while you were making the documentary for people to take away? And, and has those expectations been fulfilled? Wow. <laughs> you know, it's so, so amazing when I listened to that song, just it never went away. That's the message, you know, the, the struggle to believe in things that are profound and pure in a world of division, in a world of strife, in a world where you're going through a lot of, of personal duress on top of all of what's happening globally and, and in your community and in your family, all these things are happening. So just to believe to people to believe in the in, in the power of 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 hope and each other and and the depths of what all of the profound and incredible art that has been created in the history of the planet has pointed towards 
whether you believe in God, whether you believe in, in the universe or the power of something greater than us, just the idea that that's still out there, no matter what you're seeing in front of you, that's still true. Amazing. Amazing. Well, it's one of the most inspiring documentaries, and you are so inspiring, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.